Hello everybody, it is our second consecutive off-topic video this week, and I'm doing it as a voiceover. I wanted to talk to you about an article that I've had published, and also why I think the history of the countryside is important, and why this channel has started by looking at the past. Before we get into that, I've made a Discord for the channel. Please feel free to join and talk about the videos or the food system or animals or whatever else that we haven't yet discussed on the channel, which is most things. I've even made some custom emojis for you. You've got all the main characters and a few Jeremy Clarksons. Link in the description. Also linked in the description is this, which is an article I've written with some advice from Professor John Martin, who is a rural historian. It more or less covers what we've been talking about on the channel recently. It uses the oral testimonies you've seen here to argue that farmers didn't think the government's introduction of scientific agriculture during World War II was oppressive. Now, I am a historian by training, so if I want to understand an issue, I will look at its past first to understand it. I knew from being within the farming community that there is an awful lot of cultural pressure against modern agriculture in favour of rewilding or organic farming or regenerative farming or whatever else, but the policy changes that have come along with that have been viewed very sceptically by farmers. But the modern agriculture the government is trying to unravel in the present day was introduced very suddenly in 1939, so there were farmers in the 1930s who did the sort of farming they now want us to return to. These farmers oversaw the change in methods during the Second World War, so I decided to investigate what they thought about it, and they thought it was essentially a good thing, which would suggest to me that modern agriculture was a good thing. Please read the article and let me know what you think. But while reading about this, I discovered the previous debate about land during the 1920s and 30s, which was really the same as the debate we're having today. They asked questions about the environment, housing, rural culture, class, the problem of what to do with farmers and the aristocracy in modern Britain. We've summarised the three broad answers to these questions in this video. But what's really fascinating is the character of Lord Limington and the fact that the writers who like nature and promote nature do so for political reasons. They want what they see as a natural society. It has very little to do with the environment and nothing to do with climate change. Human beings are just monkeys in shoes. We're not scientific creatures. We think in stories. And Limington and his friends established a really good story that has endured. Their story essentially says that environmentalism must react against modernity and oppose scientific agriculture on behalf of nature. This was established way before climate change became an issue and even before scientific agriculture existed. They were writing this stuff in the 1920s and 30s. But as climate change has become an issue in the present, and people are becoming concerned about the environment, they turn to this story, and there is now a lot of cultural purchase for things like re-wiggling rivers and reintroducing beavers. I'm sure we could find lots of ecologists to tell us these things are good for nature, and they will be assessed on their merits on the channel in future. But these things are surely a distraction from the actual problem of climate change, which is about emissions. There is lots of science saying that nature-based solutions to climate change actually make the problem worse, essentially because if we stop producing food here, but still eat food, we just have to import it. And almost certainly from somewhere where food production has a worse carbon footprint than it does here in Britain. This article argues conservation in Britain is bad for conservation if you look at the bigger picture. There's lots of reasons these ideas are popular, which we will talk about, but I think one of the most important is that it fits within this pre-existing cultural story that environmentalism is opposed to scientific farming. This is why the study of history is important. It shows us how these narratives that shape the present debate came to be. This is important because the narratives also shape modern science. Science doesn't exist in a vacuum. If nature-based solutions are trendy, which they are, there's funding available for scientists to research them and their findings will be reported in the press because people want to read about them. 
To illustrate how science is not always very scientific, I would like to discuss how we measure the impact of methane emissions, which is the most important thing we will ever discuss on the channel, and it will be the subject of its own little series of videos in time. Methane is a greenhouse gas emitted when stuff rots without access to air, essentially, which happens within cows and sheep as they digest their food. It also happens in rice paddies, which no one ever moans about. Methane is more potent than carbon dioxide, but one way we measure the potency of methane is to compare it to carbon dioxide. You can measure methane as a carbon equivalent. As you see on this graph, over a 100 year period, methane is 28 times more potent than carbon dioxide. This means methane is 28 times worse than carbon dioxide, and cows are very bad for the planet. This method of measuring the impact of gases is called GWP100, Global Warming Potential Over 100 Years. This has been notably promoted by an ecologist called Joseph Poor in this article. This was regurgitated in the media with the BBC producing this graph that says dairy milk is very bad compared to alternatives. I have already discussed the water section of this graph in this video. Joseph Poor wants to see labels on food so consumers are very aware that milk and beef are bad for the environment, which he's doing through a project called Hestia, which provides free and methodologically harmonised data on the production practices and environmental impacts of farms and food products. And it's a collaboration between the University of Oxford, where he works, the Logan Five Foundation and WWF. The money seems to come from Logan Five, which was founded by the same man behind Logan Eco, which is a company pushing for an organic vegan agriculture. The work they're doing is very interesting, and I'm sure we will talk about it in the future, but the Hestia project aims to make the stuff normal farmers produce look bad. They want a big red label on milk and beef. But that initiative is funded by someone who runs a company that has a very different vision of the food system. I don't think that's a coincidence. Just quickly while we're on the topic, I would oppose environmental labels on food because they're reductive. If you had a farm that produced wheat and beef, the wheat grown directly for human consumption would be considered very good for the environment and get a green sticker, whereas the beef would be considered very bad and get a red sticker. But this overlooks the fact that the beef produces manure and muck, which would be used on the ground growing the wheat. And this muck would reduce the need for fertilizer to grow the wheat. So the fact that the farmer had beef would actually reduce the environmental impact of his wheat. It's a system. So labeling one part of the system as bad and the other part of the system as good overlooks the fact that it's all joined together. But anyway, Point being, one way of measuring the impact of methane is just to say that it is 28 times more potent than carbon. I would now like to introduce a chap called Miles Allen, who is really important. I understand he's essentially the bloke behind the concept of net zero, and he has a very long job title, but he's not an ecologist, he is a professor of geosystem science. Alan believes that using CO2 equivalents to measure methane, like the GWP100 method we just looked at, is inaccurate, as unlike carbon, methane decays in the atmosphere about 10 years after emission. Carbon doesn't decay in the atmosphere, so just multiplying carbon by 28 to estimate the impact of methane is inaccurate. They don't behave in the same way. This is from a lecture that I will bung in the description, by the way. It's not very long. I encourage you to watch it. These graphs give a sense of how methane behaves relative to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Crucially, because methane decays over time, a constant emission of methane doesn't really cause warming. It causes a little bit of warming because it decays into carbon, but this is in stark contrast to a constant emission of carbon dioxide, which sees it build up in the atmosphere and warming increases. If you decrease carbon emissions, the carbon already in the atmosphere will stay there. So as you reduce emissions, the increase in temperature slows and with no emissions, it levels off. But if you reduce your methane emissions, the methane already in the atmosphere decays and you're putting less in the atmosphere to replace it. So the amount of methane in the air goes down. Decreasing carbon emissions slows warming, but decreasing methane emissions actually has a cooling effect on the planet. 
Here is an equation that takes this behaviour of methane into account. The carbon equivalent method is the first bullet point, which simply says the carbon equivalent is equal to 28 times the amount of methane. But in this slightly more advanced method, you multiply last year's methane emissions by 128 and subtract the estimated methane emissions from 20 years ago multiplied by 120. This method is often called GWP star, and part of the reason it is almost never used in official statistics might be because it seems a bit complicated, but it's only a couple of multiplications and a subtraction. The important point here is that if methane emissions have fallen by more than 6% over the last 20 years, they have the same effect as removing carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. So although dairy farmers particularly get bashed in the media all the time, GWP star suggests that British farmers are not destroying the planet. The amount of cattle in the UK, and therefore also the amount of methane produced by cattle in the UK, has fallen a lot since the 1970s, from about 15 million animals to about 10 million. This is a decline of more than 6% every 20 years. This represents a cooling effect on the planet. And this cooling effect has been enough to offset just about all of the other emissions associated with agriculture. Here's a graph that Miles Allen used. You can see here that the effect of methane from agriculture is decreasing. The effect of carbon is negligible anyway, and the increasing nitrous oxide is counteracted by the decrease in methane. This means the total is about flat, which is what net zero would look like. This would suggest that British food production is damn near net zero, and the reason no one talks about this is because the government and most scientists use GWP 100 and not GWP star when they calculate the environmental impact of farming. I do find this a little frustrating because it's a massive positive story about British agriculture. We feed people and do our bit for the planet, but you don't hear about this in the media. I feel if a prominent scientist did a credible climate model that said aviation was probably net zero, we would have a massive nationwide party because we could still go on two international holidays a year without feeling guilty. But instead, the science says we can feed ourselves sustainably and we probably already are doing which is much more important and the media's response has been to completely ignore this and continue bashing farmers for destroying the planet. Now you may well have watched this and thought the Hestia project might be funded by a rich vegan farming bloke but Miles Allen's lecture is to all these farming industry bodies that's the moneyed interest as well. But that's my point. This is why history is important. You have to understand the narrative. People believe stuff because of a story. Veganism is because dairy hurts, but then they pull out a scientist to give weight to their beliefs. We must understand why people believe what they do before we start looking at which side of the debate is scientifically correct. Had this channel started with science, we would simply observe that Joseph Poor says one thing and uses GWP 100, while Miles Allen says something else and uses GWP star. Both of these methods of calculating emissions are accepted in the scientific community. Vegans and the BBC use Joseph Poor's metrics, while the NFU listens to Miles Allen. The science is very important, but there is a cultural divide here, which I think we must explain first. But that said, it is hard for me to see how you could justify using GWP 100 as it is inaccurate and we need to get our climate modelling right if we're going to fix climate change. But anyway, thank you for watching. I hope you found that interesting. We will cover this all in future, but I wanted to both justify my historical approach to these issues and also float the methane point because I really want to refine this argument for when I roll it out properly, so if you have any thoughts or disagreements, I would be very pleased to read them. Next week, we return to normal scheduling and we'll have a look at the Scott Report, which was the blueprint for the post-war countryside. I'll see you then.